So the Master Gardener program, a lot of people think that you have to be an expert on a gardening topic to become a part of it, but really we're people who love plants or love learning and want to make a difference in our community. I had always had an interest in gardening, but I finally decided to act on it and get a little bit more involved after I got my first home. My favorite aspect is talking to new and novice gardeners and trying to get them interested in it the way I started out. Master Gardeners are a part of Iowa State University Extension and Outreach and they're really helping their communities by building knowledge and also increasing access to different types of plants through their plant sales or maybe educating people through their demonstration gardens. The education that comes out of interaction with other master gardeners, volunteering in the gardens, as well as participating in the education sessions is what I look forward to. So if you love nature, you want to make things better in your community, in your backyard, this is a very good program to help you do so. To become a master gardener, someone has to go through the master gardener training. One of my favorite parts of the master gardener training is when everybody comes to Iowa State University and we call it class on campus. And it's such a fun day because people really want to be there. They just want to learn more. One of the main reasons I started with the Master Gardener program was because I really wanted the education. I learned from the people and they learn from me, so we share all the knowledge that we gather. With the self-confidence of learning more about things and um, you know trying different things, I'm more educated, I can kind of pass that on to my kids and it's fun to be able to give back. Master Gardener volunteers are amazing. They're these people who build partnerships and get things rolling in their community, whether it's volunteering as a Master Gardener as part of the county fair or supporting 4-H youth who are really interested in vegetables or some other types of plants. Master Gardener volunteers can be a part of these different types of Iowa State University Extension and Outreach programs to really work as volunteers to extend the mission of Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Welcome everybody to the second part in this three-part series of Becoming an EM Tree. And tonight we are focusing on identifying those insects. My name is Ray Cruzy, and I'm here to introduce you to tonight's speaker. And in the chat box, we would like you to be super involved with this uh, conversation and this program. So in the chat box, please enter where you're joining us from and possibly how you heard about the program. And like I said, this is the second part in a three-part series, and tonight we're going to be focusing on insects and you. And I have the privilege to introduce to you Laura Isles. She is the director of the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic, and she has helped us in creating some of the hands-on programs that we're going to be doing this fall, uh, hosted at our local counties here. And I'm in Dubuque County, going to be hosting one of these programs uh, for hands-on with identifying insects and uh, diseases. And here are some of the other counties that you will see these programs at. So like I said, this is the second uh, session in the three-part series of Becoming an EM Tree. And tonight we have Laura Jesse Isles, the director of the PIDC clinic, and she has been identifying bugs for over 20 years and now is helping us at the county level try and identify bugs and helping out clients just like you. So with that, I introduce you, Laura Isles. Hi, thank you, Ray, and welcome everyone. I'm excited to talk about insects with you. I'll pull up my slides here. So as, as Ray said, I've been identifying insects for a long time. I've probably loved insects my entire life. So hopefully tonight I can teach you and and help you enjoy insects a little bit, learn a bit about some of the pest insects and you know how to manage those pest insects without harming all the beneficial insects. Um, this picture here is a leaf gall, it's on an oak. This gall is caused by a tiny wasp and the tiny wasp larva feeding inside has caused the oak tree to create this amazing growth, these cool yellow and orange colors and galls are one of my favorite things to observe on oak trees and take photographs of. So when we consider insects and we want to begin to kind of understand insects and how they can be pests and causing problems in our yard, 
one of the first things we always consider is just the insect life cycle. So that's how an insect matures from egg to adult. It's one of the primary ways that we use to sort insects. There are two main types of life cycles, the simple life cycle where we have the egg, the immature stage and the adult stage. And the immature stages are called the nymphs. Um, we also have a complete life cycle where we have egg, immature stages, pupa, and adult. And in this case, the immature stages are called larva, but sometimes we have special names for them, like we call um, caterpillars for the immatures of moths and butterflies, or maggots for the immatures of um, uh, diptera and flies. So just to kind of show you here a uh, life cycle, this is an example of a simple life cycle. So we have eggs here of the grasshopper that overwinter and hatch in the spring. And the eggs hatch to a wingless nymph that feeds on plant tissue. And we get several nymphal stages until the adult stage. So the damage to plants, in this case holes in the leaves, is going to be very similar from adults and immatures. And the limbs look very similar to the adults, but they don't have wings. So with the complete life cycle, again, we have that pupil stage that really separates the immature stages from the adult. And so here the example is Japanese beetle, where we have the eggs that are laid in the soil. They hatch into to white grubs, these kind of C-shaped white larvae. They pupate and then emerge as, as adults. So in this case, they're feeding in very different habitats. The damage is not similar. And the immatures look very different from the adult. That pupil stage really serves as a time when the insect can completely transform its shape. Again, another example of the complete life cycle, this uh, beneficial insect, the lady beetles, where the eggs are laid in, in clusters on leaves. The eggs hatch into larva. The larva um, feed on aphids, they will pupate right there on the leaf that people will often, you'll find those attached to the underside of leaves and then the adult lady beetle emerges from that. So this is a case where the immatures and the adults actually feed on very similar things, aphids. The immatures actually eat a lot more aphids than the adults do, so you definitely want those on your plants, but they look very different from the adult lady beetle. So when we're assessing garden insect problems, our question really is, is who is the culprit? So we want to follow those diagnostic steps. And that was covered on Tuesday with Lena. So if you didn't get to tune in on Tuesday, you know, be sure to go back and watch that tape to, watch, to, to learn about those diagnostic steps. But, you know, particularly just identifying the plant is so important um, for insect diagnostics as well. Remember that insect damage could look really similar to disease problems and environmental problems. And I would say this is, you know, something as you as you garden, it becomes, it's kind of a fun part of gardening. Over time, it gets easier to kind of guess, I call it, because it's always kind of a guess if damages from disease or insect, we call that biotic or living or environmental abiotic. But always expect to be surprised. I, I learn all the time that something that I thought was, you know, just, you know, cold injury turns out to be an insect leaf miner. So, so you learn over time, um, but it's always fun to, to kind of guess and, and see if you're correct or not. So insects damage plants by, by feeding on them. Plants are their food. So any damage that we're looking at is damage caused by their mouths. And insects have two types of mouth parts and they cause different types of damage. So we're gonna go through those mouth parts and some examples of the damage they cause. So insects with chewing mouth parts bite off pieces of plant material they chew it up and swallow it. So very similar to our mouth parts. So the damage will include holes, skeletonization, tunneling, basically missing plant material. We've got several insects that are pests on trees. All of them just happen to have the complete life cycle. So beetles and caterpillars, we have both wood borers and leaf feeders, sawflies, which are leaf feeders, and the, the wasps, like the galls in that first picture that we, that we looked at. So I want to talk about the, the wood borers. Um, wood borers are one of our more serious tree pests. It's primarily beetles, but we do have a few moths that are wood boring caterpillars. You can see here in the pictures the type of damage that they do underneath the bark, that tunneling as the, lar as the larva feed on the wood. When wood borers emerge, um, the beetles, they tend to have very clean holes. It looks like someone literally took a drill into the tree. 
Um, in this case, and then you can see there in the middle, it's a, that's a caterpillar um, wood bore, and then um, the flat-headed wood bore tunneling. When we think about wood boring insects, we kind of separate a little bit into some of our native and our invasive. So first I want to talk about our native wood borers. And, th and these are kind of some broad generalities, but most of our native wood borers in Iowa have evolved with the trees they attack. And the trees recognize the feeding and response. So, so plants have um, kind of an immune response. Um, it's very different obviously than ours, but they are able to recognize insect feeding and they respond with anti-feedants and other things um, to kill the insect and things like that. So our native wood borers, the trees recognize them. So because of that, the females really prefer to lay their eggs on stressed trees. So the female beetle looking to lay her eggs, she can see you know, signs that the tree is under stress that even sometimes we can't see with our eyes. And she lays her eggs on that tree because she knows that tree can't respond as well. In general, these insects that are native do not occur in large populations. And in this case, treatment is not recommended just because the tree is already under stress and that's why it's being picked on by these native wood boring insects. This is really different than the invasive, um, some of the invasive wood borers and we'll talk about emerald ash borer in a minute. In this case, the females are laying eggs on completely healthy trees. The trees don't recognize the feeding. They don't have that response to it. And then we can really build up these large damaging populations. There's very few natural enemies, predators, parasites that feed on them to help maintain lower populations. And in this case, treatment is effective because we have otherwise healthy trees being attacked. So native wood borers in young trees, we see this quite a lot and it's something to, to look out for. So young trees can be stressed and in decline as well. Um, we often can figure out why. Sometimes it's poor planting. Sometimes they've been planted too deeply. Sometimes it's just poor soils or a tough environment. Sometimes there's been physical damage to the bark, you know, even from a weed trimmer or things like that. And so these wood borers know that this tree is under stress and they attack. And you can just see in the picture, you know, that you can tell from the crown that there's already some branch dieback. And then you look down at the trunk and the bark's already flaking off. And then there's wood borers um, tunnels there under that bark that's flaking off. So what can you do about this? You, you really want to focus on keeping the trees healthy. Really avoid any damage to the trunk. Um, this is a tree in my yard that had deer rub on it and it eventually declined and died. So we didn't wrap it and protect it in time in the fall. You want to be sure to water young trees. Um, young trees you know, often have a limited root mass. They're trying to catch up the root mass to the above ground parts. Um, we're looking at possibly more drought like conditions this summer. So as you're trying to establish trees, be sure to water them and water them into the fall as well. And then mulch is so important because it helps kind of maintain soil temperature and really keeps the grass away from the base of the tree. The grass competes very strongly with a young tree. Um, for, for water and then you know mowing and things, you risk um, bumping the bark and damaging it. So we don't recommend treatment. There's no wound sealants don't work. Um, insecticides don't work. It's kind of try to prevent the problem to start with. So we also get wood borers in older trees. Um, why? Very often the tree, is, the tree is stressed for some reason. It, it could just be reaching the end of its kind of natural life, a, a tree in the city you know, 70 years is, you know, kind of reaching the end of what we would expect from um, a tree in kind of stressful urban conditions. There could have been construction damage, you know, new sidewalks or something that damaged the roots, storm damage, something like, you know, the derecho we expect we'll probably see following that sort of damage, internal decay and possibly wood borers following, following that, um, wilt diseases, um, so basically wood borers is a sign that the tree is in decline. There's something wrong. And in this case, we recommend that people, you know, assess the hazard of the tree. If this tree fails, does it pose a problem to property or people and, you know, potentially remove the tree. Again, treatment's not recommended because the insecticide will not cure the underlying tree stress. And oftentimes the tree's, you know, vascular system they need that to move the insecticides around. So if it's already under stress, that vascular system is not going to work very well. So this is really different than a non-native wood borer, in this case, emerald ash borer, which unfortunately many of us are very familiar with. 
now emerald ash borer feeds on all ash species. It's a native to Eastern Asia. It's not a pest in its native habitat. So in Asia, it acts just like our native wood borers. It only attacks ash trees that are stressed. It was first discovered in the Detroit area in 2002, but it had probably been in the area for a couple of decades prior to that. And it kills a tree by tunneling just right underneath the bark. And just right under the bark is where all the vascular system of the tree is. And so once there's enough tunneling, it essentially girdles the tree and kills it. And this is very typical. Many of us are unfortunately becoming familiar with this. Look, these are green ash. The emerald ash borer beetles start, they lay, they lay their eggs at the top of the tree. And so we see death from kind of the top down. And then with the green ash, they, they push out leaves where they can. And so kind of in the middle of the tree there. So it kind of ends up with this. I mean, the tree is alive. I mean, it's obviously got green leaves and things like that. But this tree is probably just a few years um, from being completely dead is um, the emerald ash borer um, just continues to attack year after year. And so management in this case can be very effective if it's used before the emerald ash borer causes a great deal of damage because, again, we need the tree to be able to move that insecticide around underneath the bark of the entire tree. And so if the tree is otherwise healthy, um, it's a tree that you, you want to preserve for, for shade or things like that, the insecticides can be very effective. The treatments must be applied for as long as you want to protect the tree. Unfortunately, emerald ash borer are not going to go away anytime soon. So as you, you know, think about treatment and get estimates on cost, just keep in mind that they that we will have to be treating our ash trees for as long as we want to protect the tree. Whenever we're using insecticide, we do think about you know pollinators and exposure to non-targets. Luckily, ash are wind pollinated, so limited exposure to pollinators, but always you know be careful and read those. Um, label directions. Um, I recommend if you're considering treatment to an ash tree to read the emerald ash borer management options pamphlet. It goes through all the different um, options that there are. So we're going to switch from insects that are feeding on the, the trunk or the bark of the tree to insects that are feeding on leaves or needles of the tree. Again, we're still with insects with these chewing mouth parts. And we're going to talk, um, I'll talk briefly about beetles, caterpillars, and sawflies. Um, here in these pictures, you can see examples of sawflies. Uh, sawflies look very much like caterpillars, but they don't have little hooks on their feet like caterpillars do. And so you can see here the birch sawflies, how they're kind of kind of arched, their backs are kind of arched over their head like that. That's very typical of sawflies when they're disturbed. You can see the damage here of the scarlet oak sawfly. We call this window painting. It doesn't completely eat the leaf, so the sun will shine through the leaf. And then finally, the hawthorn leaf miner. So if you have especially thornless hawthorn, this is um, very typical damage to brown leaves. I mean, it doesn't hurt the tree. It kind of happens every year, but um, I guess they don't look most attractive. But by the time you see this damage, the, the leaf miner is long gone. So I want to talk about bagworms. Um, bagworms get their name. You can see it's a, it's a bag, and it's got a caterpillar inside, so not technically a worm. The evergreen bagworm is really considered an urban pest. So you do not see this very often, you know, out in the forest um, situations. In Iowa, the range does not extend much past Highway 30, but if we get successive kind of warm winters, you do see them extending north. You know, we get reports out of, you know, Waterloo, Cedar Falls area. And these urban areas um, often are several degrees warmer. And so they kind of are these heat islands where the bagworm can survive the winter. So you can see there, that's the head of the caterpillar. You can see the insect, the six legs there. The caterpillars live in this protective bag. It's made of silk and plant material. There's just one generation per year and the caterpillars are feeding from June to August. They pupate and then the adult moths are present in the fall. So the adult female, she actually doesn't even have wings at all. So she never leaves the bag. And so bag rooms overwinter in the egg stage. Actually, it's just eggs inside the dead female's body. And so because those eggs are so exposed out in this bag, um, really cold winter temperatures will kill many of those eggs. But many eggs will survive. And because the caterpillars are right there in that bag that, that mom was in, they crawl out and they start feeding on the same tree. So because that moth is a that female moth is wingless, we really end up with repeated defoliation of the same tree. And it will eventually um, kill the tree like this. And, and certainly make it not a very attractive tree. 
treatment's very effective for bagworms. You want to treat, you know, newly hatched caterpillars up to about an inch long. Once their once their big bags are tied off, it's too late to treat for that year. And so with bagworms, you know, contact insecticides are going to work better than systemic, especially on the conifers. Again, conifers are wind pollinated, so we've got limited exposure to the pollinating insects. Organic options such as dipole will cause minimal harm to non-target insects because they're very specific just to caterpillar pests. They will harm non-target caterpillars, but they won't harm, you know, some of the lady beetles and other things like that. Again, read those labels very carefully for pollinator warnings. And if you have bagworms on a tree, you know, that flowers such as crab apple, make sure you're only treating after petal fall. And again, check check those labels closely for any any limitations. But you know, you never want to use a contact you know, spray insecticide on a blooming tree or other plant. Japanese beetle is probably the one that makes most gardeners wince the most. Um, again, we've got a complete life cycle. This is an invasive insect. It's been in Iowa for a couple of decades now. Most, it's been found in most counties. Most people are very familiar with it, damaging both as adults and larvae, just one generation to, per year and prone to large populations. So the Japanese beetles' eggs are laid in the soil. The grubs are feeding, you know, kind of on the, the roots of the grass and other plants. And then they emerge as adults, you know, usually early June, mid-June is when we first get to get the first reports. They don't have many natural enemies. Again, they're in, an invasive. And so primarily the things that control their populations are summer drought and cold winter will help reduce their populations. And unfortunately, managing the larva with like a white grub treatment doesn't reduce adult population damage. Everyone always asks what the predictions are for this year. I would predict they probably overwinter just fine because we have very good snow cover most of the winter and good snow cover um, keeps the ground temperature um, just you know right at freezing. And so they, they can survive just fine that way. Damage with Japanese beetles is primarily cosmetic. Now, as people, as we all grow plants to be attractive, we don't like to hear that damage is primarily cosmetic, but overall there is, we don't see trees being killed by feeding by Japanese beetles, even though the defoliation can be um, almost complete some years. So not treating with an insecticide is an option that trees can handle that defoliation. The problem with Japanese beetles is population sizes can be hard to predict you know, year to year. And systemic insecticides that are you know, put on the tree and taken up um, by the tree can be as they have to be applied usually before we know the population size because you usually want those on several weeks before feeding starts. Again, insecticides and our concern about the non-target insects. And I always remind people killing the beetles um, won't repair the leaves. The leaves are already damaged. It doesn't bring the leaves back. Um, and also, unfortunately, with Japanese beetle, you end up with a lot of dead beetles um, around, around your tree. So, you know, we're talking about insecticides with these invasive insects. And that's one of the real shames about invasive insects. They, they cause so much damage, you know, to our ash trees and things like that. They're so disruptive. And because they're invasive and they don't have their natural enemies, we really do get limited on our control options. And so we do talk a lot more about insecticide management than certainly most of us would like. Some options with the, the Japanese beetle, I mean, ignore it is, you know, obviously the easiest option, but there's some products, there's a product that does not harm bees. It's called Beetle Gone. Um, it is a Bacillus thuringiensis and it just will um, kill the beetles. I have not tried to shop around for this anecdotally. I've heard that it may be hard to find. So other than that, most of the things that you're going to use to manage Japanese beetles, if you decide to treat, are going to be highly toxic to bees. It's very difficult to treat one insect and not another insect. These insecticides will, are, you know, will control all insects. So we have to be very careful in how we use them. So um, we're not um, trying to harm all the beneficial insects. So we just, we do not treat flowering plants. And again, you really want to leave, read that label directions carefully. The pyrethroids and carboral are ones that you would spray. Systemic insecticides like that you would pour around a tree, dinotefron and imidacloprid are possibilities. Those labels have changed uh, maybe four or five years ago. You can no longer use them on basswood or linden trees. And I know linden trees are certainly one of the favorites of Japanese beetle, but linden trees have such amazing flowers. And if you've ever been around a, 
a linden when they're blooming, you know how many, you know, bees and honeybees and native pollinators are on them. So systemics are, um, you cannot use them on those linden or basswood trees. So next we'll move um, to, to insects that have piercing sucking mouth parts. And so we've moved to like a completely different type of way of feeding on the plant. So these are insects that pierce into the plant and suck out uh, the plant juices. So the plants sometimes will get bleaching, bronzing, stipple. There's all sorts of kind of words for the symptoms. Sometimes we get honeydew. If you've ever had aphids on you know, a tree or a house plant, you know all that sticky honeydew that literally the, the insects poop and it contains a lot of sap and sugars. And I, I guess honeydew is a more pleasant name than insect poop raining down on your deck. So that's what we call it. Um, so we've got a lot of these insects that are pests on trees just happen to have a simple life cycle. So not all insects with piercing sucking mouth parts have a simple life cycle. It just happens that the ones that are pests on trees do. We have some bugs that are pests, lace bugs, stink bugs, box elder bugs, you know, leaf hoppers, mites. I'm just gonna talk to you about um, scale insects because I think those are some of the ones that cause um, the most damage to trees. So scale insects can feed on the leaves, twig or trunk the damage can be stunting, early fall coloration, just decline, and sometimes the scales even produce honeydew. I'm just gonna go um, and talk quite a bit about the oyster shell scale, but these are just a few other scales um, that we commonly get in the clinic. Scurfy scale on a locust tree. In this case, it was a tree. This was a tree in a parking lot and the tree was already kind of under stress. And that was probably why there's so many scale insects on it. Kermie scale on oak, so sometimes we'll get, you know, brown tufts of leaves on oak and we'll find those, you know, round kind of globular scales on it. And then finally there's that picture that's a magnolia scale. Magnolia scale are pretty bad. There's those kind of pinkish gray things on the branch. So if you ever see a lot of, you know, stickiness under your magnolia trees, kind of a, a black shadow, that sooty mold actually from a mold growing on all that honeydew. Um, you know, definitely get in touch with me and we can talk to you about how to manage it because over time magnolia scale can cause quite a lot of harm to magnolia trees. They used to be pretty uncommon common in Iowa, but we see a lot of them now. <coughs> so I want to talk about um, the hard scale, uh, the oyster shell scale. So it feeds on individual plant cells, just piercing sucking mouth parts, very small. So it's got the eggs the crawlers, and that's the only stage, the nymphal stage that moves around, and then the adults. And there's just one generation per year. And you can see here just oyster shell scales on a tree trunk. They sometimes kind of look like lentisols, um, a natural part of the tree, but they'll scrape right off with your fingernail. This is the underneath of a female um, oyster shell scale, just showing that how she holds the eggs underneath her body over the winter. So we have another insect similar to the bagworm where the eggs are held right, right in the female's body. And so they will begin feeding on the same tree that their mother was on. I really wanted to talk about this because I'm seeing a lot of oyster shell scale on autumn blaze maple, which is a tree that's been pretty widely planted in Iowa as a, as a street tree and in yards. Um, and we see oyster shell scale on it. And this is a typical damage that we see. We see twig and branch dieback and then early fall coloration. So if you have a branch, on your tree that you know come late July or August is already turning red prior to the other branches you really want to take a closer look at it and we kind of are seeing it um, on the younger trees um, oyster shell scale feed on a lot of different trees but I mostly um, receive samples of it on you know lilac and maple and so why are they damaging because those infestations get worse over time that female holding her eggs under her body they can disperse on wind or as hitchhikers on other insects, but many of them stay on the same branch. And they're also very difficult to manage. It's only that crawler stage that can be um, affected by the insecticide. So we're really focused on you know, trying to smother, smother the eggs, smother those crawlers. So you really want to try to avoid bringing oyster shell scale into your landscape in the first place. So it's always important to check you know, any plants at the nursery before you bring them home. You can prune out heavily infested branches. You know, if you notice it's just a single branch on your tree, you could go ahead and prune that out. You can also scrub, scrub them off with a soft scrubber, although usually I see more of them than I would want to um, try to scrub off. And then you want to check for crawlers 
in late May to early June. So we're kind of getting to that point right now to, to watch for crawlers. And we kind of what we call egg hatch indicators. So there is are a couple of plants, the spirea and the miskim lilac, bloom at about the same time as egg hatch. So it's always nice to have, you know, that to kind of, you know, check and see if this is the time the eggs have hatched, and then maybe treat within a few weeks of that. And also you can use double-sided sticky tape. And just okay, this gives you a sense for how small the crawlers are if you're on this uh, piece of sticky tape. So we've got a lot of management options. We've got dormant and horticultural oils that are effective at smothering the eggs and those young crawlers. And you know the horticultural oils are nice because they usually um, don't cause you know harm to non-target insects. Um, you can use contact insecticides to kill crawlers. Systemic insecticides are not very um, the imidacloprid that is very common is not effective. Dinotefron is. Again, you're going to want to very carefully read and follow those label directions, things like, you know, lilac that are blooming. You might not want to use these insecticides on, you know, and, and to be honest, if you've got a, a plant that's, you know, pretty much covered in scale insects, it's probably under quite a bit of stress. And sometimes I've, you know, I just go ahead and remove, you know, dogwood and things but when they're covered with on the scale insects. If you are treating, remember that the dead adult scales remain on the, will remain on the tree. So you want to watch for um, scales on the new growth just to assess if your um, treatment is being effective. So just to, you know, talk about just kind of in general of assessing insect damage to plants. So we want to know who's causing the damage. And, you know, I went through some, some pest insects tonight, but there's so many different species of insects. So this is something that you just kind of, you learn a bit over time, and then we'll talk next week about some of the resources and things you can use. But, you know, you can tell, you know, okay, is this damage chewing or sucking? If it's chewing, I'm going to be more suspicious of a beetle or maybe a caterpillar or sucking. I'm looking for aphids or maybe a lace bug. Can you find any insects? Um, unfortunately, sometimes the damage is already done and we can't find the insects or the insects that we do find are not actually the pest insect at all. But, you know, you always want to look and see if you can find any. And usually you'll find more than one insect if it's a pest. So, you know, why is it that important that we actually, you know, identify the insect? Because the, the life cycle and learning about the life cycle of the insects really tells us, you know, quite a bit about it. We'll know the number of generations per year. Many insects are just one generation per year. So if they're, you know, large caterpillars, you can say, well, I think the damage is already done. I don't need to worry about it again this year. But if it's something that has several generations, you might want to be watching out um, for more of them in about a month. It kind of lets us know what the damage potential is. Is this a very serious pest to this plant or is this something not to worry about? And it helps us decide if we want to take a management option and if we do what we want to do. And, you know, I think the big question that we always ask is, is management useful? Um, are the insects the cause of the plant stress or the symptom? Is the plant too far gone for management to help? And you really want to think, will management improve that the current plant appearance, or is it going to improve the health long-term um, of the plant? And also, you really, you know, choosing plants, choosing plants that have fewer insect problems, have resistance, you know, you, you, most of us are pretty familiar with some of the plants that are the favorites of the Japanese beetles. This might not be one to plant right next to your front door where every day you have to see the Japanese beetles defoli defoliating it. So kind of selecting, selecting plants can help reduce your insect um, problems. But just to kind of, you know, want to end a little bit on a high note because as an entomologist, I love insects and I kind of feel sad talking about um, all the pest insects. Um, remember the vast majority of insects are harmless or useful. They estimate that there's 200 million insects for every human on this planet. There are so many insects and they are so amazing. And of course, you know, we talk a lot about the good things they do. Of course, the pollination, control of garden pests, help break down organic matter. You know, their foods are, I mean, they're really a key part of all ecosystems. And, you know, I, they're so fun to observe. I mean, you can go out into, you know, any garden and you're going to find a ton of insects. And for the most part, they pretty much ignore you and go about their lives. And so for me, it's really fun um, to observe them. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more um, next Tuesday on, you know, how you can kind of photograph insects in some communities um, you can get involved with if you get excited about insects. So 
I take a ton of insect photographs in my yard. This is just a photo of a parasitic wasp here, so beneficial insect. Carrion beetles, usually, you know, not our favorite to think about something kind of breaking down um, dead organic matter and things, but so important um, service that insects provide us. We have many journalist predators, um, like centipedes. Again, they run pretty fast and, you know, tend to startle people, but, you know, feed on a lot of different pests and are beneficial that way. So aphid mummies, um, you know, you can see in this picture, that top one, there's actually three different insect species here. So the aphid mummy there at the top, that's actually an aphid that's been parasitized. So a little tiny wasp larva fed inside that aphid, and now the aphid's kind of hardened off. And pretty soon, a, a, you know, a parasitic wasp will come out of that. In the middle there, we have a serpent fly larva that's a predator, kind of hard to even see there. And so, um, but it, it feeds on the, the aphids. And there um, you see the aphids both winged and unwinged. So winged aphids are aphids, um, when kind of things are a little crowded, the aphids will produce winged ones that will move to, to a new plant. So you often see kind of groups of winged and unwinged aphids together. And aphids are, they they just clone themselves. So the females just clone themselves and give birth to live young, which is why you'll see kind of large ones surrounded by a bunch of um, little aphids. So it's, she just clones daughters. The serpent fly, that kind of little maggoty thing that we saw, it's also called the called hoverfly. They're also one of my favorite to, to photograph. They very often mimic um, wasps and you can see the kind of coloration like a bee, but it is a fly. And then, you know, flowers are really important um, for predators. I mean, we tend to think about, you know, pollinator gardens and things like that, but most of our predatory insects and, you know, the parasitic wasps, you know, as larvae, they feed on pest insects, but as adult, adults, they really need that pollen and ne nectar. And so here on this, you know, plant, we see all the green lacewing adults, we see the lady beetle adults. So all of these things, you know, having them in your, your yard are so beneficial to all um, the predators and the parasites. Just the lacewing adult, um, this is actually the lacewing larva. So the adult feeds on pollen and nectar, but it's the larva that, that feeds on the pests. And so I think in this case, there were some aphids here, but this lacewing larva has pretty much consumed all the aphids that were on this plant. And so I wanna, you know, thank you for your attention. I know we did kind of a whirlwind look through the insects. Um, please, you know, feel free to send me an email. and. I just wanted to share this picture with you because I, I love how much, you know, people love their, their trees and want to try to save their trees. This is probably one that once it reaches this point, you know, you might consider replacement, but I do always enjoy um, how much we care for our trees and want to protect them. So I will figure out how to stop sharing my screen and then we can take questions. Awesome, Laura. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful information. And just for all of those out there listening, feel free in the chat box, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, to submit any questions that you have in relation to bugs out on the landscape. And we'll ask Laura those questions. But in the meantime, Laura, I just thought it was wonderful how you ended the presentation talking about how, you know, most of the bugs that we have in our environment are beneficial. We don't even know they're there and they're, they're just helping us out or either that they're just hanging around. Yeah, they're doing their own thing and enjoying your garden too. So, you know, they're going to be there. So you might as well kind of, I just say you might as well learn to enjoy them. You're growing the plants for the insects. Yeah, yeah. There, I have a lot of clients that come in that that ask me about some bugs and, you know, are wondering whether they're bad or not. And, uh, you know, a lot of times that they're not really anything harmful at all. They're just present on the flowers. And I tell folks, you know, just, just enjoy them along with the flowers. So. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So I don't know if we have any questions coming in. We'll see if we have some uh, coming in um, and we'll flash them up on the screen here and see. But uh, I was gonna say, Laura, in the meantime, uh, we can talk about too, at the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic, when someone submits a sample to you, you know, an insect sample or something like that, what typically happens? You know, you guys might receive the insect sample in the mail or something like that. Can you explain the you know, order of operation as to how that goes? Right. So insect samples come in and sometimes people send them just like in a, you know, container. Um, Soft-bodied insects like caterpillars do well with like hand sanitizer to preserve them. And 
unfortunately or fortunately, we all have a lot of hand sanitizer in our vehicles lately. I just open the lid and toss whatever insect inside um, with it. Um, and you can send it to me that way. Um, you can send pictures to us, um, you know, the, the actual plant material itself. And then, you know, we, we take a look at it. Um, I look at it under the microscope, you know, have all the books there and, you know, make an identification and then, you know, reach out, you know, reach back to, to whoever has sent it in and, you know, talk about is, is management necessary and what options would be good or, or not good. And, you know, just kind of share some information about the insect. Yeah, well, that's great. So we have an, a question that came in. Uh, Judy Osterhouse has, says, we've been inundated with squash bugs, not stink bugs. How do we prevent from having them? So squash bugs are one that if you're, if you're growing, you know, pumpkin or zucchini or mini squash in your yard, you've probably experienced squash bugs. They are frustrating. The problem with squash bugs is they start out, you know, um, they're kind of like little bronzy eggs underneath the plant. And so if this is a garden and you just have a few plants, start looking for those eggs, just crush the eggs. I, I, I've said that for years and then last year I tried to crush stink, um, squash bug eggs and they're you know, rather hard. And so I ended up just kind of ripping out the little piece of the, the leaf with the eggs on it. But you really want to watch because you can, you know, treat with something labeled first, you know, squash bugs on squash. But once they're the adults are very hard to treat, they do kind of, you know, spend the nights underneath the plant. So, you know, you can put down, you know, newspaper or board or try to get them to kind of gather underneath and, and get rid of them that way. But it's something to watch out for with all, with all insect pests in general. Be out there, be looking, be aware, because once there's hundreds of them, you're really, you're just, you're kind of scrambling to catch up. But if you catch it right away, and I mean, you can, you know, just use soapy water and things like that on the very young nymphs. Great. Well, we have a question coming in from Megan Volk. Uh, do you recommend treating for grubs in the urban yard? If so, when should we treat? Thank you. All right. So great question. Um, so we only recommend treating for grubs if you've had a problem with them in the past. And now, a lot of there's a lot of things that affect turf grass, and we know that you know white grubs get blamed a lot, but it's very often not. Um, some situations where we do see where grubs have been a problem is sometimes if there's outdoor lighting or a street light or something that's attract the the June beetles or mass mass shapers to the area. We'll see a lot of egg laying underneath. But you know when you have like a white grub problem, you can usually just pull just lift the grass up because the grubs have completely eaten the roots. And so the two kind of treatment times are before there's a problem, before kind of July 15, and then after you observe a problem. But I would say, I, you know, it's not something to, to worry about unless you kind of have had a history of white grub problem. And, you know, even if you do, you know, end up with some damage, certainly fall is a great time to kind of rake out, you know, put down a little soil and, and some fresh grass seeds. So for most of us, you know, white grub problem, white grub isn't something we need to treat for every year. But then I have a pretty messy yard and I just try to remove all the grass and plant trees. <laughs> awesome. Well, we also have somebody that came in with a question named Flower Lady and I saw you had a picture of 10 caterpillars. What is the proper way to treat them? I get them on my apple tree and I currently cut the nest and out and then burn the nest. So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, great question, Flower Lady and, and great name. So yeah, 10 caterpillars and I'm, I'm seeing them now um, here in central Iowa. So they're very small. So they usually spend the night in that, that tent right there in the crook of the tree. Um, I, I kind of got the ew factor. They don't like to crush bugs, but I mean, you really can just, you know, crush them in the tent at that point or remove the tent. Um, if you don't, you know, want to, to prune it out, pruning it out and then burning it's fine. I do sometimes we get people who want to burn it in the tree, but we really recommend not you know, applying fire to the tree because you can harm the bark and, you know, expose it to things like that. So um, you're doing exactly the right thing, or you could just kind of crush the tent with the caterpillars inside. Awesome. So we have a question from Carol Camp. It says, if you have a infestation of striped potato beetles two years in a row in a smaller garden, should you take a break from planting potatoes for a couple of years? Oh, yeah. So, you know, we talk a lot about rotation and things like that. And rotation is difficult for insects because they can they can move around. And so, you know, taking taking a break for a couple of years, if that's an option, um, that will help reduce the problems. Although it's amazing how quick insects will find you. 
potato beetles are a real problem because, um, you know, hand picking them off is one option, but they are very resistant to a lot of different um, insecticides. So they, they don't look like they should be, especially those larvae. They're kind of, you know, those, if you've ever seen those big red larvae on it, you know, they don't look like they'd be resistant to a lot, but they really are. So yeah, taking a break can help, but then kind of similar to the squash bugs, watching, catching problems early, you know, and, and trying to attack before you've got large populations. Sure, we have a question here from Kent Fries. How do you go, how do you treat milkweed bugs and beetles? Great question, Kent. And, you know, milkweeds are always kind of an interesting one because very many of us are growing milkweeds for monarchs and, you know, the butterflies and things like that. And so at that point, it becomes, you know, kind of impossible in some ways to treat one insect like the milkweed bugs and beetles and not, you know, potentially harm um, the monarch caterpillars and things like that. I don't worry much about milkweed bugs because they're primarily feeding on the, uh, the, the seeds and usually there's plenty of seed production or I can get seeds elsewhere. Um, I, and I tend to worry more about aphids on the milkweeds just because aphids bring in lots of predators, those lady beetles and those lace wings that can also feed on the monarch caterpillars. But again, unfortunately, it's kind of, it's hard to kind of control one insect and not potentially harm what you're, you know, very often growing the milkweeds for. But, you know, again, insect, you know, following the label, you know, safer soap sort of products would be minimally harmful because they don't have much residual, so. Awesome. So with that, that is all the questions we have for this evening. We would really like to thank you, Laura, for being part of this presentation and part of this program and helping reach those out in the counties with their bug questions and helping to identify insects in the landscape. So uh, with that, thank you all for joining us out there across Iowa and everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.